Good morning from Washington, D.C., and welcome back for the fourth and final week of our program, Cyberspace Security Priorities for Africa's National Security Actors. My name is Dr. Nate Allen, and I am the Africa Center's Assistant Professor of Security Studies and Faculty Lead for this program. It's my honor to moderate today's program, where we're going to discuss national cybersecurity strategy. So we have a lot to get through today and some excellent speakers lined up, so I'm going to keep my remarks on uh, review and last week's session to a minimum. I think maybe my biggest takeaway is that a lot of African countries are making really rapid progress in setting up institutions to protect their critical information infrastructure, and in particular national and sectoral computer emergency response teams. And I think our, our panelists made, made clear that there's a lot of lessons to be learned and assistance, not just by looking outside of Africa, but within the continent itself, using the experiences of countries like Ghana and Niger, and in thinking about how to adapt critical infrastructure protection to a country's local political context. Um, for colleagues who are interested in either setting up a national or sectoral computer emergency response team or in broader efforts to protect critical national information infrastructure, I really strongly encourage you to read, to use the readings we've, we've linked in the syllabus. You'll find a couple of very practical resources that are recommending good practices, guidelines and for, for critical information structure protection. And we have or just will add an additional resource on the Global Forum for Cyber Expertise Critical Information Infrastructure Capacity Framework, which was just released uh, last week and, and should be available on, on, the, on the Global Forum for Cyber Expertise website and will make it into our syllabus. Um, so with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna introduce today's session. Um, we're gonna talk about national cybersecurity strategy. And in my view, developing a national cybersecurity strategy is an essential element in ensuring a coordinated multi-stakeholder Whole, whole of government response to cyber threats and challenges is absolutely essential. And today's session has three main objectives. First, we're gonna discuss the process of drafting a national cybersecurity strategy and identifying its core elements. Second, we're gonna discuss the role that security sector actors play in the design and implementation of national cybersecurity strategy and policy. Um, third, we're gonna outline core principles, good practices, and lessons learned during the crafting and implementation of national cybersecurity strategy and policy. And with that, I'm really delighted to introduce today's three excellent panelists. Um, we have Abdul Hakim Ajijola, and I invite everyone to turn on their, their videos if they haven't already. And Abdul Hakim Ajijola is the chair of the African Union Cybersecurity Expert Group and chair of the Nigerian National Cybersecurity Policy and Strategy Committee, which recently released an updated National Cybersecurity Strategy and Policy for Nigeria. He is also the Commissioner of the Global Commission for the Stability of Cyberspace and Executive Chairman of Consultancy Services, uh, Support Services Limited, a cybersecurity firm, a consulting firm based in Abuja. He formerly worked at the Office of the National Security Advisor in Nigeria, where he played lead roles in developing national ICT policy, technology sector strategic planning, and in setting up the country's National Computer Emergency Response Team. He is currently ranked number one on the IFSCC's list of global cybersecurity professional influencers. So welcome back, Abdul Hakim. Uh, Thank next, you. We, we have um, Piero Drago, who is the CEO of Technology Services for in Innovation, which is a firm that specializes in digital strategy and transformation. <coughs> he has played a leading role in the development of the internet across Africa for many years and has advised governments across the continent, including Burkina Faso, um, on cybersecurity strategy and policy. He led the implementation of the Digital Francophony Strategy, 2020 strategy, which was adopted by a 2012 summit of heads of state of French speaking countries, and is the founding member of numerous African internet organizations, including the African Network Information Center and the Africa CERT. Um, finally, we have with us uh, Grace Githaiga, who is the convener of the Kenya ICT Action Network, a multi-stakeholder platform that works closely with government, security sector, civil society, and other experts to inform ICT policy and regulation in Kenya. She is the host of Take on Tech, a weekly broadcast television show uh, by Kenya's uh, national broadcaster, the Kenya Broadcasting Corporation, and she has served as the African Civil Society representative at the Commission on Science and Technology for, for Development at the United Nations, 
and for the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise. Again, welcome back, Grace. It's really an honor to have the three of you with us today. Um, we're going to start with Abdul Hakim and Pierre. We're going to talk about processes, good practices, and lessons learned in national cybersecurity strategy based on pretty recent efforts in Nigeria and Burkina Faso, respectively. And then we're going to hear from Grace about how civil society has played an important role in informing national cybersecurity and strategy and policies in Kenya. So, Abdul Hakim, um, as chair of Nigeria's National Cybersecurity Policy and Strategy Committee, uh, you played a leading role in the development of Nigeria's recent, recently released National Cybersecurity Strategy and Policy. Um, it's linked in the readings um, and was released just a few months ago. Um, so I'd like you for you to describe for us how Na Nigeria's National Cybersecurity Strategy was developed and implemented. Um, how was the, the process initiated? Who was the lead agency involved? And what were some of the main challenges that you faced in, in Nigeria's National Cybersecurity Strategy? Uh, development and, and, and publication. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, colleagues and uh, Nathaniel, thank you very much. Uh, let's just take a step back from the question for a moment. Uh, first and foremost, let's understand that a policy is the statement of intent with a why or the justification, while the strategy is the plan for achieving the policy intentions with deliverables, responsibilities, rational outcomes, comes key performance uh, indicators and other metrics. Now, many of us believe that policymakers in general develop great policies, plans, and strategies, but that our weakness is only in professionally written policy strategies and plans are actually severely flawed. And the policymakers did not actually adequately factor the implementation challenges in their documents. The core elements of uh, our national cybersecurity policy and strategy, uh, that's in the Nigerian case, uh, really include the what to do, the tasks, um, when to do, the timelines, and of course, who to do, the institutional mechanisms and partnerships. Uh, it also outlines some of the funding and performance assessment uh, imperatives. Uh, given that we assumed a collaborative environment that leverages public-private uh, partnership, um, you know, which speaks to the implementation issues. Uh, implementation challenges and mitigation strategies are there, and we, we have to look beyond just the budget. We usually you know, always blame the budget, but it's, it's often more than that. Uh, however, uh, we do appreciate that if there is a lack of government appetite to invest in policy and strategy, then we have to you know, consider uh, creative partnerships. Um, sometimes we misread government intentions. Uh, during the development of the Nigeria's national IT policy back in 2000, um, the then president basically made a statement that IT was a national priority. And this was interpreted to mean that the legislation would be summarily passed, um, you know, that uh, the legislation, I mean, to create the institutional mechanisms and that the re requisite budgets would be painlessly available. Uh, unfortunately, getting the legislation took seven years. And of course, uh, you know, getting the, the budgets have been erratic. So as an example at the policy level, it is understood that modern military kinetic engagements are often preceded by cyber exploits as observed in Russian incursions into Georgia in 2008, Ukraine in 2014, and even more recently uh, in 20, I think 19 or 20, yeah, 19 or 20. Um, and even the Pentagon's first war, uh, cyber war on ISIS uh, commenced with cyber attacks on its communication infrastructure in 2016. Um, and, you know, the U.S. also has attacked uh, Iranian weapon systems. Uh, I think there was a case on the 23rd of June, 2019. And the first case of a physical response to a cyber attack was an Israeli airstrike in retaliation for an alleged Hamas cyber attack on the 6th of May in 2019. It is therefore imperative that, you know, the, the national security establishment develop a robust cyber culture. Uh, across the uniformed and non-uniformed national security operatives. Furthermore, specialized cyber units would be established 
to protect our national values and interests. So this for me is an example of the kind of policy and strategic uh, uh, things that we have to look at. Now, in our case, uh, the security sector actors did play a central but not exclusive role in national cybersecurity strategy and policy development. Uh, and this also begs the question, who are the main cybersecurity actors? Uh, frankly, a telecoms uh, technical staff or a technical staff in a telecoms organization or provider might be much better, more cost effective at identifying, addressing, and resolving cybersecurity threats than the national security operative. And we look at the Estonian model where we have private sector technical capacity coordinated with military discipline through regular drills and war games to combine the best of both worlds in cost effectively optimizing national security uh, interests of the nation. Now, in terms of the good practices that arise um, you know, from really they arise from our understanding of the intended outcome of the policy and strategy. It, and that is, it is implemented in the best interest of stakeholders. Uh, therefore, stakeholders must feel involved in the development process. And the document must be understood. To be understood, it must be read. To be read, it must be short, direct, and easy to read. Uh, frankly, if you subject many of our policy documents to the Flesh Kincaid reading, Ease formula, uh, which comes free in Microsoft Word, you will be horrified at the results. Uh, too many policies are written in convoluted, arcane formats. They are incredibly dull and bland. And frankly, such documents need to be simple, as often the political and strategic policymakers do not really understand the nuances and technicalities of the subject matter. And sadly, many technocrats don't even have the know how to address these challenges. And maybe more importantly, they do not have the power or the agency to do so, even if they know what to do. Again, many policy documents are often wrongly targeted. The drafters often target senior policymakers who have attended prestigious policy development institutions and not the middle level public servants who have not yet attended such courses, but are charged with taking extracts from the policy document to use them to design implementable, implementable projects that actualize that same policy. So it's often the, po the policy statements are often very difficult to identify. And really, I, I would advocate for some kind of methodology for policy statements to be specifically highlighted to make the document um, e uh, idiot proof uh, so that those policy statements are easy to find. Uh, again, policies are often developed in plush city offices by people who do not understand or have insight or empathy for the stakeholders in the trenches. And thus, those who are going to make actually benefit from the positive impact. And uh, in winding down, many policy documents uh, we generate, to be fair, are clear on what they set out to achieve in terms of objectives, but they're often weak on why such imperatives are necessary. And this includes the belief system, uh, the national uh, philosophy, our national ethos, which arguably our, many of our societies have not agreed upon. And so the strategic implementation component is by necessity because we've not articulated properly based on that philosophy and ethos uh, is often very weak uh, with insufficient clarity. And so that leads to frankly, very weak KPIs and other performance metrics. Uh, that said uh, in Nigeria and many of the countries in Africa, it is difficult to plan but we must plan regardless of the uncertainties and indeed regardless of the lack of credible and detailed statistics. Such details are not easy decisions and, uh, to make and they are fraught with intricacies and sometimes intrigue. And they are often encased in political ramifications that the drafters, especially public servants prefer to avoid because it might negatively impact their career progression. Let me let others speak, thank you. Thank you, Abdul Hakim. So I think you made a really uh, insightful kind of insight into how there are lots of trade-offs in strategy documents and you're balancing at once the need for it to be widely read and understood across a wide range of stakeholders, for it to have a concrete statement of objectives, ways, ends, and means, and for it to actually be, be implemented. And I'd, I'd like for you to maybe drill down for us a little bit more about some of the key tensions between uh, various stakeholders in the Nigerian 
cybersecurity strategy and policy process that that you took part of. So you mentioned how you know it's essential that that the security sector actors be uh, a, one of the key actors involved in formulating and implementing a, na a national cybersecurity strategy and policy, citing a wide range of examples across the world. But also how you know, given how you have a lot of human capital, a lot of technical expertise in, in, in the private sector, it can be a challenge to find what the right balance is. So I'm curious, what does that balance look like in the Nigerian cybersecurity strategy defense process? What were some of the key sources of tension between security sector actors and civilian actors during the cyber strategy uh, development process in Nigeria? And how were these issues uh, reconciled? Very quickly, yeah. the, 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 it's like a tightrope, you know, the, 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 it's the, the Achieving a balance is not fixed, it, it's kinetic, it shifts um, really per minute, per day, per hour. Um, but frankly, in our case, uh, the discussions were generally cordial and respectful, though sometimes it was fraught with uh, challenges uh, because sometimes national security elements who often were relatively young compared to some of the other members of the committee, uh, uh, sometimes as young people thought they often knew better about how to articulate issues because they had attended some of these uh, prestigious overseas training programs. Also, national security actors tend to treat most outsiders with suspicion, which sometimes causes them to, you know, sometimes dismiss good and genuine uh, suggestions. Um, but one of the things we did do was that we ensured that we went around the table to ask each member directly for input. Um, and then when they made their input, often followed up with a, a why question or asking them to justify their stand by walking through how it might work in the real world. Uh, this not only kept everybody attentive because they could not be hide behind silence, but it also made the process more efficient by reducing the verbal back and forth to a manageable level. In addition, uh, specifically with our committee, we broke into three subgroups which focused on two or three areas which ended up being chapters uh, with intermittent full committee plen plenaries to interrogate and accept or otherwise modify the outputs of these subgroups and thus we endeavored to keep our conversations focused and at times we had to take specific individual misgivings off the table so that the chair the secretariat and those individuals could uh, hold separate discussions uh, very often, one of the key lessons here is that stakeholders really need to be seek to be heard. But when confronted with considering how uh, what they've said will be achieved, given the circumstances, such as budget, political will, or technical limitations, then they were more willing to find and find, you know uh, seek face saving compromises. Uh, lastly, on this, the secretariat, uh, to be fair, was efficient, uh, was actually quite responsive and certainly worked extremely hard, uh, despite sometimes you know, trying to override the committee, which again triggered pushback from members. But um, you know, we, we all understood, I think, that we were working on a bigger picture. And where this bigger picture came about was because right at the beginning, the very first week, we spent the whole week listening. We listened to outside, that is foreign experts, we also listened to local experts, including those who had developed previous iterations of the policy and strategy so that we understood where things were coming from. So I think that first week of simply listening and learning set you know, a very good grounding, even for the national security operatives um, you know, to learn so that we all moved forward, understanding that there was a bigger picture. Thank you. Thank you very, very, very much, uh, Abdul Kim. Yeah, so it sounds like you did an excellent job kind of establishing this very uh, open kind of inclusive process that allowed various stakeholders to reconcile issues and, and various tensions. So, I mean, we've talked about some of the role that national security sector actors played. I'm curious, what, what in your view do you think the role of, of other stakeholders are, including non-governmental stakeholders like civil society, the media, and the private sector? How did they influence and shape the outcome of the national cybersecurity strategy development process in Nigeria? First of all, I think the lead up to the process, to the core process, um, was delayed and drawn out. And indeed, we had a few false starts. And then COVID struck. But these delays ironically enabled the Secretariat to solicit from several uh, agencies, 
sectorial and civil society stakeholders in advance uh, some re uh, analysis from their perspective of previous uh, iterations of, of, of the policy and strategy prior to the formal inauguration. So people, those uh, other stakeholders felt they had uh, uh, an input. Uh, furthermore, I think which was very impressive for Nigeria is that we ensured that the committee membership was reflective of not only sectorial players, but geopolitical, because in Nigeria we have uh, our regional zones. And uh, so that geopolitics is very important. And I must say, um, we also had a good gender representation. So like I said, crucially during that first week, we listened. Um, and so we also, because we brought in those um, indigenous and international experts, when we actually had our first draft and we went to a stakeholder session, um, there was actually very little uh, pushback because many of those people who had either sent in written comments in advance or those experts who, who tend to be the uh, people to overcome the difficulties, obstacles, had had their, not only had their say, but saw some of their say here and there reflected um, you know, in the document. Uh, frankly, we did have a very uh, tight timeline. Uh, this also kept us uh, a bit more focused though it made things uh, rushed. But um, that one public interaction and ended up being a validation session because of all those other things that had been put in place beforehand uh, made things relatively smooth. In, in fact, it's one of the better uh, validation sessions that I've actually participated in. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. So I think your your remarks really highlight the importance of inclusivity as part of a, a national cybersecurity strategy process, right? How at the very least it's important to actively incorporate women, people from different sectors, the civil society, you know, because ultimately you want buy-in in your national cybersecurity strategy. You want popular support. You want it to be read. If you don't include those stakeholders, you're not going to achieve kind of the impact that you, you might want. Um, so thank you very, very much for that really excellent uh, rundown of the, the uh, Nigerian national cybersecurity strategy development process. Um, now it's time to talk about Burkina Faso as kind of a, a comparison to Nigeria. We have with us uh, Pierre Rodrigo. So um, Pierre Rodrigo, I, 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 you know, I, here Burkina Faso has had multiple rounds of national cybersecurity strategy, I believe, with the most recent strategy released a couple of years ago in, in 2019. And I'd like you to, to give us an overview of, of this process and maybe compare it, uh, the process to what we just heard about, about uh, the process from, from Nigeria. So in Nigeria, how, and in, in Burkina Faso, how was the social cybersecurity strategy process initiated? How was the effort led? And what were some of the main challenges faced by, by the, the leaders of the process? Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to share uh to to learn of your experiences i see that and to share with you i see there are about 100 participants with us today that is so important to help uh to to lead to mutual enrichment so in terms of working at faso i will first speak of the process that took place before the current process uh, so we were able to uh, benefit from uh, uh, from an early warning system, from trainings, and to to have uh, regulations that were put into place, and and also we also engaged all of the different stakeholders. This. There was a strategy that was developed uh, prior to today, but we were not able to include all the actors of civil society. And as Abdul uh, underlined it earlier, it is important to establish a culture, a culture of an ecosystem that will allow one to reach one's goals, objectives in terms of cybersecurity. So in terms of 
as of 2017, based on the prior experiences and under the national uh, security um, system, an inclusive um, path was taken in terms of the National um, Association of um, Cyber uh, Technology in our country, the ANSI, sorry, I was cut off, the National Agency of Computer Information was put into place, but there was a problem. The Army said, okay, security, so that's us. The Ministry of the Interior said, oh, well, then it's us in charge. And so it was important to put all of, and others said this should be the domain of the Prime Minister. And so finally, the NC, the National Organization for Security, um, waited until we until 2017 when the national agency for information security was well established and that is when we were able to start the real process that would lead that will lead to um a new document at the end of the year in 2017 with everything that took place before what we first saw was the um elaboration of a committee, interministerial committee that um, that was put in place. The represented, there were representatives from finance, from economy sector, the justice sector, national defense, trade, um, and also the National Agency of Promotion of uh, Information Services and the committee com computer agency the national agency of training for computer training and also uh, people from civil society were also included so the work started up as a, a basis of support, a certain number of documents, because first we had to take stock of what was going on. So we had to look at the laws. Uh, there's, for example, the law on uh, IT security in Tunisia. We used that. We looked at uh, cybercrime documentation from Cameroon, the Malibu Convention on Cybersecurity and Protection of Personal Data. We examined those documents and the law um, linked to cybersecurity that used by France. Now, of course, we looked at standards as well and, and basic IT, uh, you know, we looked at the technical side as well. And then finally, the Budapest Convention on Cybersecurity. So this was consulted as well. And we looked also at ECOWAS because we're part of ECOWAS. So there's an interministerial committee on one side, which includes representatives from all the most concerned sectors. And the other side, we have this um, base of, of documents that looks at the references that, that we can use throughout the world for this. And so this process made it possible to draft a law on uh, the security of information systems. There was a, a national workshop that was held in, on September 13th, 2017, and this brought together all the actors, including civil society, and allowed everyone to state their opinions on, on these various elements. So this process made it possible to arrive at a, a bill uh, uh, that is currently in front of the National Assembly. And I must also say that during the discussions on this uh, proposed bill, there was also the uh, national security policy was under discussion. So the two were linked together so that this important element of national security um, was taken into account within the national security policy, which itself was debated upon. 
uh, by you know all the parties participated in the de debate regarding this policy. It was not closed off and exclusive. And so now we have this law that is being presented to the National Assembly or will be soon. Now, the actors from uh, the national security sector, from civil society, from the media, as you can see, all the stakeholders were involved uh, during the, the workshop that I mentioned. Now, within the documents, during the establishment of NC, all the stakeholders, uh, all, all representatives of centers that are highly sensitive for national security are, are involved, but there is still this inclusive effort so that everyone takes part or has a say. So even in front of the National Assembly, everyone will be participating and, and expressing their opinion at that level. Now, as far as lessons learned from all this, we began with the technical aspect. There was equipment uh, provided, there was training, but nothing moved, nothing happened. Once the NSI was created, there were some difficulties in, in establishing this organization. There were issues with the Minister of Security, the Minister of Defense. We had debates and we and discussions. And finally, um, and the ANSI as an independent authority was placed um, and there was given a, a, an interministerial uh, quality so that we can, it could be taken into account into a broader dialogue. Now, there was the capacity building issue and we did a lot of work on this. Uh, there were many initiatives were encouraged in the field in terms of cybersecurity. Um, we've created a, a master in s program in cybersecurity so that we would have the capacities to be able to implement uh, the law on cybersecurity. And since Abdul Hakim is with us, I had essentially put on the table during several meetings the possibility of planning the implementation of, of a network of all the agencies uh, that take care of training on cybersecurity throughout Africa so that we could share our resources, share our experiences, so that those who were ahead of others could help the others catch up. So in, you know, for example, for civil society, we have set up an Africa platform that includes um, NGOs. And, you know, perhaps we could talk about this a little bit uh, so that Africa could actually set up robust systems that where we can share because it's rare to have a country that has all the necessary resources, uh, a country that can surmount all the challenges posed by cybersecurity. But if we work together, we can accomplish a lot. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for that excellent response. I think there's a lot to kind of learn from your wisdom and, and Burkina Faso's experience. I think you highlighted number one, and as well as if we were team, the role that high level political leadership plays in ensuring that a, a strategy gets developed, formulated and implemented. It's especially critical as information technology becomes increasingly essential to every aspect of what we do in every aspect of government. Um, I think in, in my experience, the only way that you get a, a strategy document passed is usually with, with support from the president's office or a national security advisor's office, who uh, somebody who has the authority and capability to assign government-wide responsibilities, expertise and, and call balls and strikes. Um, you, you highlighted, I think, the importance of, we've heard again and again over the course of this webinar, of, of this program, you know, learning lessons from other African countries. It sounds like that was really incorporated into Burkina Faso's strategy development process. And, you know, ours old, I think you'll notice a lot, of, a lot of improvement and a trend towards greater inclusivity and clearer specifications of roles and responsibilities. So, so clearly there's a lot of important learning that was going on. Um, one last question to you. I know we're running a little bit low on time um, before we go to, to Grace. 
Um, do you have any other good practices or lessons learned from uh, Burkina Faso in the cybersecurity strategy process that you'd like to, to highlight? Any other good practices and, and lessons learned? What I could add is, is I can talk about initiative that is currently underway between Burkina Faso and the United States for the establishment of a, an academic center of excellence on cybersecurity. And that will essentially be an international partnership on cybersecurity. Some American universities, uh, American companies such as Microsoft, Cisco, IBM, and, and others um, have involved themselves in this project. And this will enable us to create a center of excellence that will initiate courses probably around January 2022. There will first be a national conference uh, in, in December, and then we will start the courses. This will enable us um, to educate high-level executives who will contribute to uh, the strengthening of cybersecurity in Burkina Faso. And, and this capacity building is extremely important. And there's also Smart Africa. In, in, at that level, Burkina Faso is leading the initiative on capacity building. And I just returned from the seventh forum on tra for trainers uh, for internet governance. And there is a, a training center that is planned as well. So basically, we must strengthen capacity. Politics may change, but we have, if we have the capacities, the skills within the country, then we can benefit uh, from this and, and cybersecurity can be improved. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for the great series of examples, I think, and for your very rich uh, presentation. Um, so just, I think, I think I've seen some comments in the chat. So my internet connection is a little bit unstable. We have, we're having problems with my home internet connection. So I'm having to switch back and forth between that and, and 5G. So um, internet connectivity issues are not just a problem with, in, in Africa, they're, they're clearly a problem in the United States as well. So um, bear with me a little bit, but, but I think I have a good connection now and I've been able to follow the conversation just like to, to make clear that's what's, that's what's going on. Um, Thank you very, very much. I'd now like to bring in uh, Grace, who um, now that we've, we've opened up the lessons learned portion of our conversation. And I'll note that while Kenya does have a national security strategy, it's dated back to 2014. Um, what has happened in Kenya is that there is a civil, a civil society has played a really, really important role in influencing national level cybersecurity strategy and policy. And as, key, as, as convener of the Kenya ICT Action Network, um, my colleague Grace has, has played a really key role in those efforts. So we want, I'd like to, to begin with us to, to describe your experience as a member of civil society, Grace, and working with government and security sector actor, actors to address ICT issues in Kenya. Uh, what role do you think civil society actors should play in the development of national ICT policies and strategies and be building a little bit on what we have heard from uh, Abdul Hakim and Pierre. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Nathaniel, and I'm really glad to be on um, uh, in this meeting once again. This is my second time, uh, so I'm really glad that uh, you invited me um, here. So, in in you know, I, I think uh, when I speak about my personal uh, experiences, you know, um, I will not be able to really distinguish that from Kitanet, which uh, you know is a multi-stakeholder platform that has continued to engage on ICT policy uh, processes in a multi-stakeholder way and actually is informed by uh, multi-stakeholder approaches. So as you know, as, as, as a person, I have learned that it is very important to build uh, relations over time with the different stakeholders and that uh, sometimes it takes so long uh, for them to trust you. Sometimes uh, because these are advocacy processes, um, uh, as opposed to projects, sometimes the processes 
take long and can be discouraging. So it's also important to actually stay on the game and uh, look at the big picture, be guided by the big picture um, as you wait for the results. And so, you know, our processes at Kicktonet, some have taken long, but we, are, we, you know, we have continued to see, you know, we have wins at every step. Although right now, you know, we, 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 we have been recognized and we are a key stakeholder, especially when it comes uh, to civil society. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, what, um, what uh, role um, that civil society actors can play in developing national ICT policies and strategies. I think I want to start by saying that uh, we are clearly seeing governments around the world establishing new institutions, identifying policy implications of the growing uh, digital uh, dependence. For example, in Kenya now, when it comes to cybersecurity, we already now have the NC3, that's the national uh, cyber, um, cyber, you know, they call it command center, but really it should be a coordination center. And when that name command is put then, it puts that um, security element into the center. Um, and so, you know, that's really a recognition by government on the need to come up with frameworks. Uh, we are also seeing uh, governments having frameworks and approaches to manage um, you know, the growth of use of digital spaces, the growth of the internet, the, the, the uptake of mobile telephony. And therefore, what uh, we as civil society have realized we need to do is actually to be conscious that as government, as the government develops these frameworks, uh, then what are the, the implications of some of these uh, frameworks for ordinary citizens? And, uh, you know, so we come in there because we need to play our role of, uh, you know, making sure that uh, the, the, the the rights that are provided for in, uh, in our Bill of Rights in the Constitution are actually balanced. So we recognize the need for regulation, but we would want regulation that balances freedoms of people to actually continue expressing themselves in a, you know, in a robust manner online. So one of our roles and uh, one of the role of civil society is to raise key issues, especially on cybersecurity intersects with human rights because uh, some of the frameworks that come interfere with people's human rights. And therefore that's a role that we have to play, mainly highlighting areas of tensions and contest, uh, you know, contestations uh, in frameworks being developed and actually just being very clear and being vocal about them. You know, there are frameworks, uh, some frameworks are aimed at ensuring that citizens, um, and, and our role is to bring in that public interest and ensure that citizens have a robust online environment that allows for engagement with confidence. So frameworks, um, you know, sometimes, you know, governments, when they suggest frameworks, uh, the idea is to control. Some actually uh, propose, um, laws that uh, curtail citizens' rights uh, to free expression, and therefore civil society must come in at that time, uh, even if it's to protect, then that needs to be balanced. Another role, of course, is to keep abreast of current developments and legislation in the field and raise awareness of the same, especially for key stakeholders that have no time to go through those frameworks, that have no time to engage and just, uh, you know, break that down in a way that is digestible. Um, another role, of course, is to organize uh, information or disseminate in a way that is consumed, uh, you know, ordinary citizens can consume. Um, and, and, and mostly those who have no tech background. And I must say that I am speaking from uh, our work at Kicktonet and what we have done and what we continue to do, you know, just summarizing certain laws in language that people can understand having thought leadership meetings for people to discuss that. And then taking that back to those who make uh, the law, either through parliament or through Senate or through the regulator. And of course, uh, I think one of the key roles all over the world for civil society is to measure the pulse of the situation on the ground. And um, for Kenya, it's also to implore public participation in, 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 in ICT policy making, including in cybersecurity, uh, which 
which is regrettably uh, being looked at as, as a law enforcement process uh, or a security uh, outfit by, by the government. And, and so, you know, we have actually consistently, uh, you know, we continue to engage with NC3, with, uh, with the Kenya SAT, and to remind our stakeholders that public participation is entrenched in our Article 19 of the Constitution. And therefore, you know, we need we need for people to come on board and actually highlight public interest uh, areas in, 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 in regulations. And of course, we promote public awareness uh, on online safety, uh, providing digital security training, reminding people that security, you know, um, is, is a personal responsibility and, uh, you know, reminding uh, stakeholders on the need to embrace a culture of online safety. And so the other thing is that we have continued to engage with service providers, again, to push for minimum standards uh, or what we call best uh, practices for ensuring that online security or cyber security. And uh, one of the key things that we have been able to do is to conduct research uh, where we continue to provide evidence-based positions, um, you know, and the context in which uh, some of these laws apply. And some we actually say, um, you know, are not applicable in our situation. I'll give an example, for example, when we were engaging before the cybersecurity became an act, uh, when we engaged with the National Assembly ICT Committee, we did impress upon them that it's, it's not possible um, to legislate uh, fake news because fake news is not a new thing. It's always been there. It's only now that there are so many platforms that people can exchange that. Uh, but, you know, they didn't listen. And after the law came, came into effect, um, you know, the Bloggers Association went to court and, you know, that law was, was put in abeyance before it could come uh, into effect. And so civil society can therefore um, inform strategy on cybersecurity as well as citizens' security. Thanks, Nathaniel. Thank you very, very much, Grace, for that. I think you gave a really comprehensive overview of all the various roles that civil society plays from, you know, some, some more obvious ones like advocacy, right, and, and, you know, communicating with the people about the impact of a particular policy, you know, advocating for a particular position to a government. Um, you also mentioned, I think, research, evidence-based research as a really, really important function that civil society can perform that is maybe a little bit less commonly understood. And I think one, one really important thing that is less well understood, but I think Kenya, the Kitson Act has done really, really well, is convening, right? And you, you mentioned kind of relationships that you've built with government stakeholders and officials over the course of many, many years that I think enable you to, to speak with some degree of credibility and have some degree of trust among government officials, you know, even though you might not see eye to eye all the time. And I think that is actually a really, really important and really, really productive thing that civil society can do is just to be persistent, to constantly be convening meetings and to try to foster at least some degree of mutual understanding and trust, even if you might fall on different sides of the issue. So I think that I would like to highlight that as well. Um, so, so you mentioned how there are often quite different views between various stakeholders and not just between government and civil society, but I think one theme that's come up listening to both Pierre and Abdul Hakim's remark is also sometimes various parts of government, security sector actors and uh, non-security sector actors, even within the security sector itself, right? You might have differences of opinion between uh, the military and the national police over who should be responsible for a particular policy entity or, 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 or strategy. So um, my question for you is, in your experience, how can government, security sector, and civil society actors overcome some of these challenges in working together to address what are increasingly important, but also very sensitive uh, ICT issues? Okay. Um, again, that's an area I'll still uh, speak as, as you know, as 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 Kiktanet, which is really a multi-stakeholder uh, uh, think tank, um, you know, with diverse industry stakeholders, and to say that there were times, and you 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 rightly alluded to that, that sometimes you know we work together, but there are times we don't see eye to eye, but the beauty of working you know, like that is, you know, we disagree and we agree to disagree, but we can still be able to sit down and have a cup of coffee. So I want to start by reiterating that, you know, 
um, what we have pushed is uh, the fact that cybersecurity is everyone's responsibility. It is not a government's responsibility entirely. And so the first thing and uh, in working together and out of our experience, we've realized that there's need to build confidence. Um, you know, how do we build confidence among stakeholders? So one of the things is that we've acknowledged that different stakeholders have different uh, expertise, they have different uh, resources they can bring onto the table. And therefore it's to build confidence and, and acknowledge that all stakeholders have a responsibility. But at the end of the day, we all have a shared responsibility to ensure that we are operating in a safe cyberspace. Therefore, um, you know, what, what has also emerged is that uh, within that, uh, within that uh, grouping where you have different uh, stakeholders, there is need to define clear roles and responsibilities so that everybody knows what they are bringing onto the table what resources they are bringing onto the table. And therefore, uh, within that, have clear leadership. And at Kicktonet, we've been able to provide that convening because uh, you know, we've been able to, to bring uh, like different stakeholders together to be able to discuss critical issues that uh, even affect, uh, say, our cyberspace. So clear leadership that is coordinated uh, and utilizes uh, multi-stakeholder approaches and then recognizes the diverse stakeholders and the value they bring onto the table has actually been one of the lessons that we've learned. Uh, but this also calls for commitment, especially uh, of uh, the institutions that are, are involved in the process. So then one of the things that we've also realized is that there's need to have uh, you know, participation of the relevant stakeholders. Uh, and uh, they are determined by the issue at hand or the issue under debate. And uh, we've realized it's very important to balance the diverse uh, perspectives and opinions from academia, from business, and from civil society, from government, and even from the technical community that sometimes does not, uh, you know, does not think that policy uh, affects them. And so, uh, you know, we, 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 we actually work in a collaborative um, uh, approach as opposed to say one, um, one um, stakeholder flexing their muscle or uh, you know, feeling that they are more superior than others. And uh, so in cybersecurity, what we have actually agreed even in our proposal when the law was being formulated is that the government needs to be the focal point for information for security matters. But civil society then uh, you know, continues to, you know, to promote public awareness on online safety. The private sector provides us with that infrastructure. The international organizations, we are talking of IEE, we are talking of ICANN, uh, we are talking of ISOC, you know, they provide the standards for operation uh, as you utilize the, the infrastructure. And so in all this way, if people are very clear on their responsibilities, on their roles, on what they bring onto the table, then you are able to work together without having to look like uh, you, you, you know, um, you know, like civil society is, is adversarial or always, you know, rubble rousing. And so I think the question that uh, continues to be is, you know, what are, for cybersecurity then, for all of us as stakeholders, what are the threats to a robust cyberspace where citizens' articulation of issues should happen in a safe uh, environment? And that is what should guide stakeholders as, uh, you know, as, as uh, one of the very important things is, you know, we build consensus and clarify uh, the interests, the roles and responsibilities of the different. And then one of the things that is very important, and I alluded to it when we were starting, is for you to work together. Trust is key. Trust is very important, um, you know, to recognize, for example, um, for those who've recognized, civil society offers value and has demonstrated uh, that value in form of technical expertise. For example, you know, Kicktonet, we've continued to, you know, we have a track record on being on course on ICT policy matters. And so uh, working together calls for that spirit of realizing that cybersecurity responses uh, should also not be 
treated as uh, security, national security matters that, uh, you know, and we know national security matters often lack transparency. Uh, and so, you know, we want a, a situation where we are accountable. We, we, you know, we are open, there's public participation. And I want to end there. Thank you very, very much, Grace. So I think it's clear, and this, this highlights, I think, themes that we've been talking about throughout the program, that um, trust, uh, transparency, and a clear division among, of labor among various stakeholders in, who are responsible for cyberspace security, from security sector officials to individuals, are crucial in uh, formulating policy, strategy, and in addressing any, any type of cyber threat. I think, I think your remarks really, really highlight that very, very well. All of these things are interrelated and go together and that, that the, the, you know, to get our, put our discussion back to, to cybersecurity strategy and policy, in my view, a cybersecurity strategy and policy is, is, at least from the government side, perhaps the best vehicle to make that division of labor and responsibility abundantly clear. Um, and, and so thank you very, very much.